I am glad to be here. You know, last night, went to a football game and I thought, this is going to be interesting. I, I haven't yet gone to a late night football game and then gotten up in the morning and preached three sermons. So let's see how I do. So far, so good, right? That's what the guy said when he jumped out of the building as he went down, you know, every floor. So far, so good. But so far, I'm doing fine. And it helps that, you know, we played a team that we could easily beat, which doesn't often happen. So I didn't have to yell that much. Uh, you know, Grambling's got a great band. So we won both ways, right? Got to see a great halftime show and won the game. But speaking of football, um, I, believe it or not, I'm not making this up, I was on the football team in high school. Yep, miracles can't happen. I, you know, growing up in a small town, that's, that's part of the joy of being in a small town. Guys my size can be on the football team. Uh, so when I was on the football team, I was not a star. I know you're shocked. I know, I know. Uh, but one of the things I got to do was I was a gunner on the punt team. Now, if you're not familiar with football, trust the story won't last long, just stick with me. Uh, but when the team punts, right, most of the players, their job is to protect the punter, keep the punt from being blocked. But the gunners, there's two of them, their job is to, as soon as the ball snapped, just run down the field as fast as they can, try to get there when the guy catches the ball and tackle him. So that was me. And there was always a guy on the other team who stood about five yards away from me and tried to keep me from getting down the field. And my strategy was always, as soon as the ball snapped, I would run as fast as I could toward that guy, put my head down and hit him as hard as I could and try to knock him off enough that I could get head down the field. And usually that worked. My senior year, we played our arch rival, Quero. Quero gobblers, yes, turkeys. Uh, you know, they, they beat us every year. They, at that, my senior year, they'd beaten us 10 years in a row. That year, they actually went on one state. They were the number one team in the state when we played them, so we knew we were against a lot of odds. And I'd love to tell you we beat them. We did not. The good news for me was we punted a lot, so I got to play a lot. <laughs> Bad news is the first time I went out and lined up on the punt team, I noticed the guy five yards in front of me was a lot bigger than usual. I mean, way bigger than usual. But still, I was 17 years old. I didn't have a lot of wisdom. I just put my head down, hit him as hard as I could, and then found myself staring up at the sky. Mysteriously, I, I was flat on my back. So the next time, I had a different tactic. I actually went around him, and there I'm running along as hard as I can, trying to get there. This guy catches up to me and knocks me down again. So he's not only bigger than me, but he's faster than me. And that's when I knew it's going to be a long and unpleasant night. And it was. I've never been knocked down so many times in my life, never. There was one time on a kickoff, when I got hit so hard, I flew through the air. It was like the world's worst gymnastic stunt and I did not stick the landing at all. Uh, it was so bad, it was so spectacularly bad that Monday morning or Monday afternoon when we gathered to watch the film of the game, which, you know, it was pretty depressing to watch anyway. But when they got to that part, they actually, the coaches rewound it five times. I counted because, and it wasn't just them. The other players were like, no, 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 coach, let me see that again. And then, hey, hey, Dwayne, you were getting dressed. You didn't see this. Watch what happens to Berger on this play. You got to see this. And oh my, is that really you? So it was, it was awful. It, it was the only time in my life. And if you're not a little boy or if you don't care about football, and especially if you didn't grow up in a small town in Texas, you won't get this. But growing up like that, you dream of the day it's you down on that field on Friday nights, right? That's, that's like the ultimate. But that was one night where I would have gladly started stamp collecting or, you know, <laughs> some hobby that doesn't involve getting, you know, blasted through the air by, by, you know, people who are destined to play college football. So I say all that to say life has a way of knocking us down. And we go through these periods where things are great, right? And then all of a sudden, slam, and just when you get up, it slams you down again. And then you crawl back to your knees and boom, you're back down again. And some of you I know are going through a period of time in your life right, like, that, like that right now. You know, one of the things about church is church is not what happens here. Y'all get that, right? I mean, this is worship service. Preaching is something I feel called to do and I love doing it, but this isn't church. We, we say that, oh, I'm going to church today. Church is the family of God. Church is, you're part of this body if you've chosen to join this church and you're not just watching online or, or, or you know, visiting. You've, you've chosen to join this family. And so what happens to you happens to all of us. And so since I get to be the pastor and I'm, I'm part of the, the staff leaders here, I know there's a lot of you in this room who right now you're struggling. 
And it's not your fault. I, I want you to hear that. You didn't bring it on yourself. You don't deserve it. It's part of living in a world that's unredeemed. And it's hard. And just like me that night, you want to give up. There was a time when life was good and you were optimistic and you were happy. But now you're struggling just to get out of bed. You're wondering, what's the next thing that's going to step on me? What's the next thing that's going to kick me through the air? What's the next thing that's going to break my heart? What do we do with that? What is the answer? The answer is one word. It's hope. Now, hope, here's the way I define hope. Hope is the joyful, confident expectation of something we know is ours, but we don't have it in our hands yet. And my favorite illustration is it's, it's Thanksgiving morning, about 10.30, 11 o'clock, and you're in your grandma's house. At least we always celebrated Thanksgiving at grandma's. And you can smell the turkey and you can smell the dressing and your aunts keep coming in and bringing pies and bringing bread and bringing potatoes and green bean casserole and all this stuff. And you're smelling as it goes by and you're thinking, oh man, oh man, it's gonna be so good. And see, there's a difference between being hungry in third period algebra and knowing that your, your answer to that is school cafeteria spaghetti, right? There's nothing happy about that. There's a difference between that and being hungry on Thanksgiving morning and knowing in an hour, maybe, if my uncle has his way, half an hour, we're going to be eating that food. It's going to be good. I'm hungry now, but I'm excited. I'm in pain now, but there's a solution. Or, or another illustration of hope, it's being engaged to your dream person. You fall madly in love. You know, you know this person is, is as good as they seem and you can't wait until the day when like the Beach Boys used to sing, you don't kiss goodbye anymore, you kiss goodnight, right? That day's coming and it doesn't matter what happens between now and then, you're gonna be happy because you've got that to look forward to and nothing can keep you down. That's hope. So I, I hate to tell you this, but it's something we don't hear about often enough in church. I want you to turn to Romans 8, 18 through 25. This is a passage that I know I've preached on it before while I've been here, and I'll preach on it again if, if, Lord, if the Lord leaves me here as long as I hope he does. I'll preach on this several times because it's one of my favorite passages. You know, sadly, when I podcast other churches' sermons, what I often hear are sermon series that are, all, that are mostly about how to have a happy life now. And it's, how to manage your money, how to build a good marriage, how to raise well-adjusted kids, how to manage stress, how to be the best person you can be. And all of that's important. And the Bible touches on all those things. And yet it, it misses the main point because we're here for a little while and we're there forever. And the Bible says the key to living a, a joyful and wonderful life now, the key to living life now is to fix your eyes on things above. Colossians 3, you can check my work. Colossians 3, fix your eyes on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God, not on things below. So here's what Paul has to say. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience." I believe there's three kinds of people who really need to hear what this message says, what this passage says this morning. And the first group of people are people who are losing hope. Right now, I know there are people who are struggling and they're, they're wondering, is there still a reason to keep on going? I read a story recently about a guy who went fishing at a lake in 
California. A friend dropped him off. He'd never fished there before. It was, you know, half hour, hour from his house. Um, you know, he's, he's fishing a while and he realizes I'm not catching anything on, the, on these artificial lures. And he decides to walk into the woods and try to catch some grasshoppers to bait his hook with. But he gets lost. He's never been there before. He gets turned around, all those redwoods. He can't find his way out. And he starts to lose hope. He actually, he actually raked some pine needles together into eight foot tall letters that spelled the word help and decided, you know, a day, a night had passed. He knew they had to be looking for him eventually. He, 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 he figured, okay, they'll see that. I'm starting to get dehydrated. I'm starting to get tired. I need to conserve my energy. I'm just going to stay right here and, and hope they fly overhead again and see those letters. You see, a helicopter had already been over once before he put the letters out. And he started as the days passed. He was out there five days before they rescued him. And they did rescue him. And I'm sure he'll never go fishing at that lake again. But he said, as the days passed, he kept being filled with all these doubts. Well, what, if, what if the helicopter's not coming back this way? What if they assume because they didn't see me there that I must not be there and they're going to search somewhere else? What if they're miles away? You start, your, your brain starts to play tricks on you. You start to lose hope. And some of you are there right now. Is there really any reason to expect things to get better? Is there really any reason to think that this relationship that seems so broken is ever going to be repaired and reconciled? Is there any reason for me to think that this health issue that's just stealing my joy is ever going to be healed? Is there any reason to think that that my finances that are in such a shambles are ever going to recover? Is there any reason that I'm going to think that this depression that I'm struggling with is ever going to go away? And you're losing hope. And here's what I can tell you. I can't tell you what's going to happen with your circumstances. I can tell you this, and this is what the scriptures say, it will all be worth it soon. It will all be worth it soon. Verse 18 Again, says, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Paul says, and listen, Paul has suffered more than anybody in this room. You look at his resume in the book of 2 Corinthians and you go, okay, now that guy knows suffering. And yet he says, it's all light, it's all momentary compared to what's coming. It's all going to be worth it someday. He knows, he knows, and he teaches us, he tells us, don't lose hope. In fact, he says, the whole world is waiting to see what's going to happen. The whole world is looking at you and me. Now, obviously, this isn't literal, but he's saying it's as if, it's as if the rocks and the trees and the sky and the, and the forest and the, and the mountains and the oceans and every animal that exists is looking at human beings saying, okay, God, when are you going to reveal what you've accomplished in them? That God has, has started this great artistic work in your life the day you accepted Jesus and someday Jesus is going to step onto the stage and pull back a curtain and go, ta-da, and all creation is going to lift up its hands in applause and cheer. Look what God did. And on that day, you're going to look at the the things you suffered and go, okay, God didn't cause those things. I didn't necessarily deserve those things, but God took them and used them to accomplish something great. And it will be worth it. it. It absolutely will be worth it. Paul's great analogy that he gives is childbirth. I love this. He says the the whole creation is in the pains of childbirth until the sons of God are revealed. Now, here's something I can promise you. I don't know everything, but I know this. Paul did not know firsthand what it was like to give birth. Anybody want to disagree with me on that? I'll fight you on that one. Paul did not know what it was like to give birth, but he'd seen it. He knew that it was painful. In Paul's day, even more than today, there were no epidurals. There were no medications that dulled the pain. And besides that, it was much more dangerous back then. Women often died giving birth. And yet Paul observed the same thing I've observed, which is women keep doing it. Women keep giving birth. And it's not all the men's fault, okay? Trust me, I know. Women are choosing this. They're choosing to give birth to children. Why? Because somehow it's worth it. Now, I remember when Carrie was pregnant with both of our babies. And I remember looking at her and going, none of this looks fun. I'm glad it's you and not me because none of it looks fun at all. And yet she was so happy in those moments. 
I mean, you, you talk to her and she'll say, I, I, I love to be impregnant. Now, some of you ladies, I know you went through a hard pregnancy. You, you, you had a lot of sickness or maybe you were even on bed rest or you had some complications and that wasn't fun. But many of the uh, others of you can resonate with what Carrie would say. You know, this is great. This is wonderful. This is exciting. And, you know, she would come up to me at a certain point and she'd say, hey, come feel it. She's moving again. And I'd be like, yeah, I know. I've done this 20 times. I've felt her moving. What's, what's new about this? But she got it because something beautiful was being produced. And you know what? Both times those babies were born. She didn't take a look at them and go, oh, is that all? No, she's not a psychopath. She was thrilled because her pain had produced something beautiful. And the pain lasted for a while and it was awful. But then what it produced lasted so much longer. And that's our story. So don't lose hope. It's producing something. It takes faith to believe this, but that's your hope. Trust me, if you put your hope in, well, I'm going to be healed. Well, what if you're not? Well, I'm going to get money again. Well, what if you don't? But if you put your hope in what your pain is producing, you won't be disappointed and you'll find joy right now, and you'll be able to get back up again. So the second group I want to talk to, and that's people who put their hope in the wrong things. See, this is the besetting sin of an affluent culture. And I know you might say, well, okay, maybe our culture's affluent, but I'm not. I'm just barely getting along. Trust me, if you, are, if you can feed your family, you're doing better than most of the world. The poorest person you know is, is doing better than about two-thirds of the world today. That's the kind of culture we live in today. That's how blessed we are. But the downside of being so blessed is we've got all these other things to put our hope in. There's a reason why when a rich young man came to Jesus and said, oh, hey, Lord, what do I need to do to go to heaven? And Jesus said, just fulfill all the commands. And he said, I'm do, already doing that. Jesus didn't disagree with him. This is a religious guy, a moral guy. And Jesus said, okay, well, get rid of all your money. Give it all to the poor. Why would he do that? Is he trying to make it hard for this guy to be saved? No, because he knows this guy's hope is set on his wealth. And you may not consider yourself wealthy, but I guarantee you there is something in your life that you're tempted to put your hope in. I know... I. If I can be honest with you, this, is, this has been my story at times. I would love to be able to tell you, and, and you'd have more respect for me as a pastor if I could say that from the day I got saved until today, it's been this long, steady upward trajectory toward Christ. But instead, it's been this jagged, this jagged journey where I, I, I peak sometimes and I'm on fire for the Lord and I'm growing. And then other times I level off and I'm just sort of stagnant. And then there are times when I dip. Even now as a pastor, I go through those moments. And as I look back across the trajectory of my walk with the Lord, I can recognize every single time what caused me to stumble was I put my hope in something other than Christ. So what what does God have to say to us in in that state? I mean, I'm still there. I'm still in a place where I've got so many things that could get in the way that, that could be my false source of hope. I've got two kids who are now 17 and 23 and, and y'all, those of you who have little kids, just trust me, it's even better when they get to be grown up. You get a, a brand new relationship with your kids, especially if they like you, which mine still do. Um, I, I love my wife. She's the best person I know. I can't, I'm not worried about the, the empty nest. I actually like this person. It, it'll be fun to uh, just be the two of us for a while. I hope she feels that way. Um, I like being the pastor of this church. I, I can't wait to see what happens as the years go by. I hope I'm here in 2030 and, and to see 10,000 transforming relationships take place and all the different ways God is going to use this group of people to change Montgomery County and beyond. I mean, I got books I want to read. I've got goals I want to reach. I got trips I want to take. I've got football games I want to see. I've got all kinds of things to look forward to. But what if I don't, right? All those things are good. It's, it's not wrong to enjoy those things. God gives us those things and he enjoys watching us enjoy them. But if I set my hope on any of that stuff, it's gonna, it's gonna let me down. See, here's, here's what the Bible says. Hope that is seen is not hope. If your hope, if my hope is on anything you can see with your eyes, it's a problem. 
Yes, good to enjoy it, but to say, this is what gets me up in the morning. This, this is what is my main thing, watching my kids grow up or uh, achieving things at work or uh, fulfilling my purpose as a husband, as a father, as a mother, as a, as a wife, as a whatever. If that's what gets you going, you're in trouble because none of those things can bear the weight. Two problems with a now-centered focus. One is when you hope in the things of this world, it always leads to disappointment. Our plans fail. People let us down. People die. Our dreams vanish. They go up in smoke. Even if we achieve just what we set out to do, it usually isn't as great as we thought it would be. One of the great stories, uh, Alexander the Great. We were just in Thessalonica in northern Greece, and there's this huge statue right on the, right on the shoreline of, of Alexander the Great, or as, as my daughter called him, Al the Eight. I thought that was pretty funny. Um, Obviously, that's just me that thinks that's funny. But um, the story about Alexander the Great is he's, a, he's in his early 20s and he's conquered the whole world, including that train if he was still here. And he looked around and, and the legend says he wept because there were no more worlds to conquer. It's like, I'm the king of the world. Is that all there is? And that's gonna be the case if you achieve all your dreams. Hate to tell you that. If you fulfill all your fondest expectations for life, you'll look around and go, okay, this doesn't quite feel as great as I thought it would. It'll pass quickly. And pretty soon you'll be that, that old man or old woman and everybody's like, quit telling me the story of how you fulfilled all your dreams because I'm tired of hearing about it. Hope in the things of this world always disappoints us. Now, there's a second thing. The th second thing is hope in the things of this world doesn't prepare us for eternity. Believe it or not, like I said earlier, we're going to be there a lot longer than we're going to be here. So why put all your eggs in this basket? When I was a junior or sophomore in college, I can't remember which, we had a, a, a kid come into our dorm, brand new freshman from someplace out in East Texas, and he wasn't the best student. He uh, failed a test his second week on campus and immediately dropped all his classes. I guess his mentality was, hey, I'm not, all, I'm not really up to all this academic stuff, so I'm just going to enjoy myself. And it got around the dorm pretty quickly. Hey, you see that kid? He's not going to any classes. He dropped them all. He's partying all night. He's sleeping all day. He's, you know, we'd see him for supper. That was his breakfast. I mean, he was living the life. And it lasted for about a week and a half. And then we came home from class one day and there was a moving van in front of the dorms. His parents had found out because the administration had, had notified them, hey, your son has dropped all his classes. And they said, no, not on our dime, you're not. And he went home and we never saw him again. And that's the picture of a person who has an opportunity to prepare themselves for something, to prepare themselves long-term. And instead they say, no, I'm just gonna have fun and the fun never lasts, and you waste the opportunity, and that's us. If all we're focused on is putting our hope in the things of this world, it's not going to last. It's not going to sustain us, and then we're going to get to eternity and say, I wasted my life. And y'all, I'm not necessarily talking about salvation here. It is possible, I believe, possible for a person to believe in Jesus Christ and to trust him for salvation and yet waste their earthly life entirely. Because Jesus saves sinners. Paul talks about it in 2 Corinthians. He says, some of us are going to be saved yet so as through fire. As if, as if imagining that a, a person who's dragged out of a burning house and all their possessions go up in smoke, but they themselves are saved. I think there's going to be some of us when we get to heaven, we're going to be that person. Yeah, we're glad to be saved. We're so thankful to be in heaven. We're so thankful to be with Jesus and out of this world. But we look back and we go, everything I built my life upon burned up. It went up in smoke. Whereas other people laid up treasure in heaven and they have something to lay before the Father. Don't be that person. Don't be that person who wastes their earthly life. Paul in verse 25 writes, if we hope for what we do not see with perseverance, we eagerly wait for it. We eagerly wait for it. See, that's one of the signs that you know your hope is in the right place is that you're excited about the return of Jesus. Quick, just do this 
just a little self-test, okay? Imagine somehow, some way, you knew that in the next 24 hours, Jesus was returning to this earth and this earth was gonna be finished. This life, done. What is the immediate gut emotion you feel? If your immediate gut reaction and, and emotion is, oh, no, 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 not yet. I'm not ready for that. No, not yet. I've still got, still got things to do. I've still got things to, to see it and things to accomplish. That's a bad sign. You're putting your hope in the wrong things. But if on the other hand, you go, yeah, come on, Jesus, let's go. Bring it. I'm ready for you. That's where we ought to be. That's the reason why we sing songs like, when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. And when Christ shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home, what joy shall fill my soul. And I can only imagine what it will be like when I walk by his side. Will I dance for you, Jesus? Or on my knees will I bow, fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak at all? We can only imagine, but we ought to be excited and if we're not excited, that's a problem. We're putting our hope in the wrong things and that hope won't sustain. And then there's a third group I need to talk to. And that is people who have never had hope. People who just never really thought about eternity, who don't even think it's worth thinking about. Some of you, if you're old enough, you remember a guy named Jack Welch. He was the chairman of General Electric. Uh, in his day, he was one of the most Prominent and well-known business leaders, multi-billionaire, wrote books, gave talks. I mean, he's the kind of guy that young executives would, would sit and drink in every word because he just knew business. He knew how to succeed. He was being interviewed 15 years ago. I read this article, uh, this interview with him. I don't remember what magazine. It wasn't a Christian magazine, but curiously, they asked him, Jack, if uh, you know, heaven is real and, and you have to stand at the gates of heaven, and they asked, you know, can you go in? Do you think you'll get in? And I, like I said last week, it's, it's amazing to me how often this question comes up in interviews of famous people. It's, it's as if God created an eternity in our hearts and, and our hearts are restless until we know where we're headed. But anyway, this interviewer asked Jack Welch, the, you know, one of the richest, most powerful men on earth, that question, and here was his answer. If treating people right, and I'm quoting, if treating people right and living life to its fullest counts for anything, I think I have a shot. And I remember very distinctly reading that sentence and laughing out loud, not because I thought it was funny, but because I was just amazed. I have a shot? I mean, this is a guy who didn't do anything without extensive planning. This is a guy who did everything the right way. You don't reach the top levels of society, of, of culture, of success without doing things diligently and doing them right. And yet he's gonna leave the status of, of, of his eternal soul to essentially a roll of the dice at the craps table? I mean, is that really what he wants? Now, Jack Welch died this last year, 2020. I hope with all my heart, he realized you don't have to have a shot at it. You can be certain of it. Paul talks about it in the passage we just read. He says, we, we wait eagerly for our adoption of son, as sons, the redemption of our body. We know, Paul says, we know it's gonna happen. We know we get new bodies. We know we inhabit a brand new earth. We know the existence we have is gonna be glorious. We get enough of a taste of it here. Every time we hug someone we love, every time we laugh at a good joke, every time we eat a good meal, every time we sit in church and rejoice and we feel the presence of God, every time we experience joy down here, it's this tiny little appetite appetizer for the meal we'll, we'll have up there that never ends. And we're sure of it. And if, if you are not from a Christian background, that may sound like arrogance. It may sound like Paul saying, yeah, we're finally getting what we deserve. Actually, quite the opposite. It has nothing to do with, with being as certain of our own faith. Let me just tell you for a fact and I know this isn't very good PR for our church. But going to this church won't save you because this is a church full of sinners. We don't put that on the marquee, by the way. That's not, our, that's not like our slogan, our ad line, come, come to our church full of sinners. But that's what we are. And, and if you want to find a different church, that's your right. It's going to be a church full of sinners too. Get baptized? Absolutely. I won't save you reciting a creed, signing a doctrinal statement, 
any kind of, any kind of uh, ritual you want to perform. There's nothing that can save you and me. Why? Romans 3.23 says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All have sinned. Raise your hand if you think all includes you. Very good. Yeah. All have sinned. We've fallen short. We don't qualify. We're out. We have no shot. None. Jack Welch was wrong. None of us has a shot. Except Romans 8 goes on to say, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still sinners. He didn't stand up on a mountain and say, okay, if you can get to me, I might redeem you. He didn't, he didn't stand at the finish line of a marathon and say, okay, if you can finish this race, then you've got a shot. No, he went to us and redeemed us. He died for us. And so the very next verse, Romans 5, 9 says, we can be justified by his blood. The word justified means considered innocent. It's, it's a judge wrapping the gavel and said, innocent. We can be justified by his blood and reconciled to God. So all of our sins are covered, washed away, eliminated by the atoning death of Jesus. And God's ready to receive us. It's not like God's like looking at you saying, okay, I guess I have to pardon you because you've got that magical uh, salvation chip. No, God runs to receive us whenever we repent. He's like the father at the end of the prodigal son story. He runs to welcome us back into his family. But while it's a gift, like every other gift, it's not really yours until you choose to receive it. And Romans 10, 9 says it this way, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you've got a shot. No, that's not what it says. Believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So what are we confident in? Are we confident in our own morality or in our church or in our pastor or in our beliefs? No, we're confident that Jesus is faithful. He's not going to let us down. He said he was going to die for us. He died for us. He said he was going to rise again the third day. He did. He says he's coming back. I suggest you believe him. He says he can redeem you, and he will. He will. He will not fail. So right now, I want to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. And this is something we don't do often enough, but I felt led to do it today. Don't worry, nothing manip manipulative. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand or, or do any kind of uh, public thing. I, I, just want you to, I just want you to ask yourself the question, do I know? Do I know where my eternal home is? Christ came back today. If I died today, do I know where I would be? And if not, I want you to pray this prayer in your heart along with me. Just say, Lord Jesus, I admit that I'm a sinner and I can't save myself and I'm tired of doing it myself. I know you died for my sins and you rose again. So come into my life today and save me from my sin. Make me a new person starting today. I give you my life in the name of Jesus Christ, amen.